I welcome you again for this NPTEL lecture on earthquake geotechnical engineering. And we are under third module of this course and lecture number 23. In the third module as we discuss, we have three chapters. The first one is on ground response analysis. So, we are discussing this uh, and this ground response analysis will be the uh, total four lectures. We already covered two lectures and today we are going to talk about third and fourth lecture. So, in we, yeah, we have three lectures for 1D GRA. So, this is the last lecture on one dimensional ground response analysis. And in the earlier two lectures, we talk about that uh, particularly about the transfer functions. Firstly, we discuss about when you have uh, undamped soil on a ridge rock, when you have then the damped soil on a uh, ridge rock and we also discuss damped soil on elastic rock. So, the transfer about the transfer function we have discussed in detail. Now, here like uh, what has been covered so far is there, but today we are going to talk about the two topics. One is what we call the nonlinear approach, another is comparison of 1D GRA. Like comparison in the sense this comparison will be between uh, equivalent linear and nonlinear approach. Coming to the equivalent linear approximation of nonlinear response how we can use the equivalent linear method. Actually, the response of the soil during the earthquake or a strong ground motion is non-linear, but we will try to uh, estimate this response using equivalent linear technique. And what is equivalent linear soil model? We have already discussed when we discuss uh, the dynamic soil properties. And if you recall, that was the lecture number 18, 19 and 20. So, uh, actually uh, lecture number 18 and 19 are on equivalent linear. And, uh, uh, last 20 uh, lecture number 20th was on nonlinear response. Coming to this, uh, how we can use this equivalent linear approximation for nonlinear resp uh, response? Since this nonlinear of soil behavior is well known, which we already discussed, the linear approach must be modified to provide reasonable estimate of ground response for practical problems of interest. And how we do it? The equivalent linear in the case here, there are two parameters which we discussed. One is called shear modulus G, which is secant uh, shear modulus normally, and the equivalent linear damping ratio, which is uh, uh, epsilon as the damping ratio. Uh, uh, so, it is uh, rather high. So, this uh, uh, and this G and chi will produce the same uh, energy loss in a single cycle for the actual, actual, actual stresses loop. So, this, this is defined equivalent linear damping ratio which we already discussed during uh, equivalent linear model that it will produce the same energy loss in a single cycle as, as was the case for actual statistics loop. Since the linear approach requires that G and this damping ratio be constant for each soil layer, the problem becomes one of determining the values that are consistent with that level of strength induced in each layer. So, what we do? We determine what is the level of shear strain in each layer and then accordingly the level of shear strain we uh, revise the value of G and uh, uh, damping ratio. And naturally for that you need to use modulus reduction curve that is G by G max versus strain and another is damping ratio curve. So, given let us say modulus reduction and damping ratio curves are given using those curves you, you use this uh, equivalent linear approximation. To address this problem an objective definition of strain level is needed and for this uh, what we do equivalent of nonlinear response that laboratories from which modulus reduction and damping ratio curves have been developed used simple harmonic loading and characterize the strain level by the peak shear strain amplitude. So, you have like normally in the laboratory what we do? We use most of the time in the laboratory simple harmonic loading or sinusoidal loading is used for the testing. And, but in case of real earthquake, it is varying, it is transient. So, the time history of the shear strain for a typical earthquake motion is uh, typically highly irregular with a peak amplitude they may that may only be appro uh, appro approached by a few spikes in the record. For example, it is here. So, what you see uh, this, this is uh, in this figure, you have shear strain versus time which is strain time history. In this strain time history, this is harmonic excitation. So, this one is you have the harmonic. So, this harmonic loading or like basically it is sinusoidal wave. While 
this one is due to the real earthquake or this is a transient motion which is good. So, in a harmonic loading as you know that you have the regular cycles after one cycle it repeat again. So, amplitude remain constant, but in transient motion you get the peak value here and here, but then after that it decreases. So, the peaks are at only few spikes in case of transient motion. So, the two shear strength time trees are there with identical peak shear strength the value the maximum value is same here for both the cases for harmonic and other things, but the difference is that in case of harmonic it is repeating after a, uh, when a cycle get complete it repeat again, but this is not the case in case of uh, for the transient motion. So, now the issue is this one how we can equate like suppose in a real earthquake scenario you you have uh, this transient motion and you want to find the equivalent harmonic loading. So, how we can go we cannot like you know that in this case naturally this what we have uh, here both uh, harmonic as typically done in the level trust and transient motion as typically earthquake that have the same peak cyclic shear strength. The harmonic represent uh, harmonic loading will represent a more severe loading condition than the transient record although the peak values are identical. Why? Because the peak was only 1 or 2 in case of transient loading, yeah, but in harmonic loading the same value of peak is getting repeated after one's completion of the cycle. So, that we need to understand. As a result what is done it is common to characterize the strain level of the transient record in terms of uh, an effective shear strain which has been empirically found to vary between about 50 and 70 percent of the maximum shear strain. So, you have uh, like you know that uh, uh, maximum shear strain. So, like uh, uh, you have peak value, but peak value in the transient response is uh, uh, strain time history is not repeating. So, what we do we have 50 to 70 percent of the maximum shear strain that is considered to be equivalent. So, what has been done from the, uh, the computer? Uh, so, from the past experience the computed response is not particularly sensitive to the percentage. However, effective shear strain is often taken as 65 percent of the peak strain. So, this 65 percent is the equivalent which is taken as the effective shear strain will be thus about 65 percent of the peak strain. So, what is done you get the peak value from that uh, transient and then you multiply by a factor of 0.65 and 0.65 then you get the kind of equivalent harmonic loading for that uh, peak uh, which can be considered to be irregular or harmonic loading. Continue with this since the computed strain level depends on the values of the equivalent linear properties an iterative process is required to ensure the property used in the analysis are compatible with the computed strain level in all layers. So, this is important what happens initially we assume some property and then we calculate the what is this level of strain is coming in the and this level of strain which you are getting then you back calculate using modulus reduction and damping ratio curves the properties uh, related to those strain it will be different it is not the same as. So, we keep doing this iterative process until there is a uh, like a, a convergence that means uh, whatever the uh, strain you assume and corresponding uh, the properties are same. So, this is the case here for example, uh, in this slide what has been uh, explained that how to carry out the iterative process for the like uh, you have modulus reduction curve that is shear modulus varying with the uh, shear strain. So, it is though not g by g max. So, it is uh, uh, it is directly and it is not on log scale it is g on y axis and uh, your shear strain on x axis. Similarly, you have damping ratio versus strain. So, let us say that in the first iteration what is done in most of the time to start your calculation you assume the in uh, the values which are at very low strain and low for very low strain let us say I assume that at 0 strain shear strain. So, at 0 shear strain the value of g is g 1 while the value of damping ratio is uh, this xi 1. So, we know that this assuming this value g and xi 1 we start our calculation ok and once you compute and after computation you will get the shear strain because to, to find out the shear value of shear strain you require the material property shear modulus and damping ratio. So, in the first iteration and then you find out the answer of the shear strain have come effective shear strain have come gamma effective 1 here. 
Now what we do? We find out the value of G and C, uh, damping ratio corresponding to the shear strain. So, corresponding so I draw a vertical line and this horizontal G2 is the value of shear modulus corresponding to this strain. Similarly, on the damping side this uh, uh, xi2 will be give you the value of damping ratio corresponding to this strain. Now you have find out so you now you need to update the value of shear modulus and damping ratio in your system and again you calculate the strain and using this shear modulus and damping ratio you find the strain uh, you find out strain and that corresponding to that strain is because the strain will be changed now the strain will not be the same as the gamma effective one. So, the corresponding to the strain corresponding to point 2 you find out the shear modulus. So, it is at point 3 and then using the shear modulus and then uh, like you know that. So, corresponding to this strain shear modulus you find out that will be your final value because here your level of strain is same. So, ultimately when you keep iterating then in the last iteration again if you do the basically idea is that you keep iterating until there is no change you, you reach to a point after which if you are still carrying out the iteration, but there will be no update in the value of shear modulus and damping ratio at that point we will left. So, here corresponding to this strain you find shear modulus G3 and corresponding to the same strain here to uh, strain is remain same you find out the damping ratio G3. So, this was the and normally uh, depending on how much nonality you have you may get the uh, convergence in few cycles maybe 3 cycles, 5 cycles or maybe 10 cycles you may not require 100 cycles or like this for convergence. Now, this was the using uh, so far whatever was discussing equivalent linear approximation continue with this. So, the steps are here with these steps I already explained you. So, for the first step initial est estimate of uh, shear modulus and damping ratio are made for each soil layer the initially estimated values usually correspond to the same strain, but the low value strain values are often used for the initial estimate. Then estimates uh, shear modulus and damping ratio values are used to compute the ground response including time histories of shear strain for each layer. Then we have the effective shear strain in each layer is determined from the maximum shear strain in the computed shear strain time history for layer j. So, suppose if you have a number of layers then for JTH layer the effective shear strain is calculated using the relation which is given here. In this relation what you have gamma effective J subscript is saying is it is for JTH layer. So, this is sub, sub, subscript and here is and gamma max is the maximum value and this is for I, uh, I superscript saying is that I is the uh, 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 superscript is denoting as a iteration number you keep iterating for the same layer. So, what we do we keep applying iteration for the same layer until you get the convergence and once convergence is reached then we find what is R gamma here R gamma is naturally the ratio of effective strain to the maximum shear strain which could be uh, like 0.65 or whatever the like. But here the value of R y has been linked with the earthquake magnitude and it can be estimated using m minus 1 by 10. For example, if I have a 7 magnitude earthquake then it will be R gamma will be 0.6, but for m if you have m equal to 7.5 which is the standard R, so R gamma will be 0.65. From this effective shear strain new equivalent linear values that is new values uh, in uh, that is uh, I plus 1 th uh, iteration shear modulus G I plus 1 and damping ratio are chosen for the next iteration. So, step uh, 2 to 4 are repeated until difference between the computed shear modulus and damping ratio values in two successive iterations far below some predetermined value in all layers predetermined value could be very less it could be 10 to power minus 3 or even if you have 10 to power minus 6 also. So, but 10 to power minus 3 may be enough for that difference. Although convergence is not actually the difference of less than 5 to 10 percent are usually achieved in 3 to 5 iterations that is 
uh, like uh, uh, you may not be like uh, if you want to get exact convergence it may take time but within the 5 percent limit you can easily achieve the convergence. Continue with this, uh, even though the process of iteration towards strength compatible soil properties allow nonlinear soil behavior to be approximated, uh, but it need to be uh, noted that a complex is, is still a linear method of analysis. Because what we do the in equivalent linear method, we do the same thing as uh, for the linear method except that we are finding the value of shear modulus and damping ratio for given value of strain. The strain compatible soil properties are constant throughout the duration of the earthquake regardless of whether the strain at a particular time are small or large. The method is incapable of representing the in soil stiffness that actually occur during the earthquake. The equivalent linear approach to one dimensional ground response analysis of layer site has been coded into a widely used computer program called SHIC. That is, this SHIC program was uh, uh, authored by Snubble et al. in 1972, that is more than 50 years back. Here, this program SHIC, this was this, these authors was at University of California, UC Berkeley. So, UC Berkeley, the some of the and then some others they have created. In the shake program, the equivalent linear approach has been used to, to carry out the 1D ground response analysis, 1D GRA has been carried out. Now, as we discuss about, uh, in very much detail about equivalent linear method, but as we discuss that the behavior of the soil is truly uh, non-linear and although equivalent linear approach is computationally convenient and it is efficient. And it provides a reasonable results for many practical problems. However, this is still will be an approximate analysis of uh, uh, to the actual nonlinear process of seismic ground response. Therefore, an alter alternative approach is to analyze the actual nonlinear using direct numerical in the time domain has been carried out. So, this is by integrating the equation of motion in small time steps any linear or nonlinear stress system model or advanced constitutive model can be used. So, so what we do? We integrate uh, the equation motion of motion in small small steps and using integration a, a linear or nonlinear stress strain uh, advanced constitutive model can be used. At the beginning of each time step, the stress system relationship is referred to obtain the approach prior soil properties to be used in the time step and by this method a nonlinear inelastic stress system relationship can be followed in a set of small incrementally linear steps. So, what we do? You have a complete time history. In this complete time history you select some window or the time step where you apply this nonlinear response and this need to be done like when we carried out uh, you know that uh, the equivalent linear approximation then we find out the strain time history for the whole time history too, but here it is done step by step. And most currently available nonlinear one dimensional ground response analysis computer program characterize the stress strain behavior that is what we call the constitutive model of the soil by cyclic stress strain models and those models so stress cyclic stress strain models are some of the models hyperbolic model which is we, we already discussed when we talk about modified hyperbolic model, Ramberg Uskod model, Hardin Drainwich, this Pike, so this HDSCP model, then Martin Dunning model, Ivan type model. So, there are a number of models are available, and these models are basically for to carry out nonlinear analysis. And there are other models which are based on further advanced constitutive model such as the nested yield surface model. So, then there are other models also. Here some of the most commonly used computer programs for nonlinear one dimensional ground response analysis are given here. So, computer program for nonlinear one dimensional ground response analysis, you have soil model reference here. So, the program name is listed here. You have char soil uh, that DESRA, DINA, MARSH, nonlinear 13 TS test 1 and the name of the soil model used in these programs are also given for a Ramberg Uskod model, hyperbolic, 
National Real Surface, Martin, then Ivan, HDCP, and references the authors who have invented those models are given in the last column. So, some uh, a number of techniques can be used to integrate the equations of motion of these the explicit finite difference technique is most commonly easily explained. Now, in case of nonlinearity, consider the soil deposit of infinite lateral extent which is shown in the like you know the next slide here. So, here in this slide what you see you have a soil layer and in the soil layer the properties are let us say v, rho s if we have single layer. Uh, if you have uniform soil deposit of infinite lateral extent overlying bedrock. So, in that case you have a single layer then the, the property is mass density as a rho s and V s s is the shear velocity for the soil layer. And it is the soil layer is lying over a bedrock and this bedrock is mass density is rho r and V s r is the shear velocity of this rho. Then with this we can divide this into a number of like you know layers if the properties are varying. If properties are varying then we have uh, from here to here like uh, you can have the first uh, layer uh, the, uh, the on the top of the first layer is node number 1, uh, the top of the second layer is node number 2. So, you have 1 to n plus 1. So, in between in these nodes you will have n layers first layer will be between 1 and 2 and 2 and 3 and like so on. So, you have n number of layers uh, which has been discretized for the nonlinear an analysis and these programs are able to do uh, deal with the when you have the layered soils. One of the program for uh, like which is based on so equivalent linear model is deep soil which we discussed earlier. Now, comparison of this one dimensional ground response analysis this comparison has been done from two aspect that suppose you carried out the analysis using equivalent linear method and the same analysis is carried out considering the some nonlinear soil model what are the dif uh, uh, difference in the results which you may obtain. So, that has been discussed in these slides. The first of all the inherent linearity of equivalent linear analysis can lead to spurious res resonances that is high levels of amplification that results from coincidence of a strong component of input motion with one of the natural frequency of the equivalent linear soil properties deposit. If suppose you have we have discussed what is the uh, this, uh, natural frequency of the soil layer. If suppose you have a soil layer which is fixed at the base and thickness of the soil layer is h and V s is the shear velocity in this case the fundamental frequency is simply given by V s by 4 h. Suppose your input motion have the similar frequency near to this motion then what will happen you will get the peak there and that is the basically you get the high peak there. So, that is the resonance condition. So, if a high level of amplification the it will be result if some component of strong motion input motion coincide with the natural frequency of the equivalent linear soil deposit. And since the stiffness of an actual nonlinear soil will not be constant rather it will be changing over the duration of a large earthquake such high amplification level will not develop in the field. So, normally it does not develop. So, that is a, that means you are on the conservative side when. So, the use of an effective shear strain in an equivalent linear analysis can lead to an over softened or over damped system when the peak shear strain is much larger than the remainder of the shear strain. So, if you get a peak shear strain at very high value compared to other peaks in that case uh, you may get uh, over softened or over, over damped system. But on another side you will uh, get an under softened under uh, or under damped system when the shear strain amplitude is nearly uniform that is kind of harmonic loading. So, in case of peak value your one peak is going very high and other peaks are very low then over softened means it could be like you know that uh, uh, this uh, uh, stiffness will decrease very fastly. And so, that will happen, but if you have the new uniform case like a harmonic loading then it could be a case of under softened or under damped system. Uh, continue with this comparison 
Equivalent linear analysis can be much more efficient than nonlinear analysis. So, this comparison is between equivalent linear and nonlinear analysis. So, these equivalent linear analysis because they have simplicity, their models are simple. So, as a result, these analysis are more efficient. They are uh, like you know the simplicity and they may not be so accurate like nonlinear, but of they are very efficient in working. Particularly when the input motion can be characterized with acceptable accuracy by a small number of terms in Fourier series. As the power, speed and accessibility of computers have increased uh, in recently. So, the difference between whether you use linear analysis, equivalent linear or nonlinear analysis that is not a, like uh, decreased. Earlier, you do not have choice, you need to carry out equivalent linear analysis because the computer programs was not available or the uh, like the speed of the computer was not so much to carry out the nonlinear analysis. But nowadays, the no carrying out the nonlinear analysis is not a issue, it can be carried out easily. Still, nonlinear methods can be formulated in terms of effective stresses to allow modeling of the generation redistribution eventually dissipation of excess pore pressure. So, this is one of the limitations of the equivalent linear method. So, if you use nonlinear model, model, then you can model excess pore pressure which is important for liquefaction analysis. So, if you need to carry out the study for liquefaction analysis, then you need to select a nonlinear model rather than equivalent linear model. So, this because equivalent linear methods, they will not be able to capture the dissipation of excess pore pressure. So, this is so in the uh, if you go from this point, then nonlinear model it goes in the favor of nonlinear models rather than equivalent linear model. The fifth point nonlinear method, me methods require a reliable stress strain or constitutive model. So, important issue is this one nonlinear model can give you better result, you can consider the pore pressure, but in these models you will require a constitutive relationship which is stable or reliable. Many times the parameters that describe such models are not well established as of the equivalent linear models and even it is difficult to find out because for those parameters you need to carry out a specific field and laboratory test and that may require to calculate the parameters of the nonlinear models. So, to evaluate nonlinear model parameters. So, issue is here uh, some points are good in equivalent linear models, some points are good in the no linear models. Now, it depends uh, the requirements. Again continue difference between the results of now when we talk about the word how much is the difference between the results of equivalent linear and nonlinear analysis that will depend on the degree of nonlinearity of in the actual soil response for problem where strain levels remain low. So, suppose see normally what happens the nonlinear models are required when the level of strain is high. Equivalent linear models are good when the lower lo level of strain is low. But suppose if your level of strain is low, then you use equivalent linear model or nonlinear model, the difference in the results will not be large, it will not be significant. However, at higher strain, there may be difference between the results of equivalent linear models and nonlinear models. So, for the low strain problem, you may consider to go with the equivalent linear models. But for high strain problems, for example, including the liquefaction then one need to go to consider rather than nonlinear model one need to consider the no, uh, rather than equivalent linear model for high strain problems one need to consider the nonlinear analysis and that is expected to provide reasonable results. So, in summary both equivalent linear and nonlinear techniques can and have been used successfully for one dimensional ground response analysis. The use and interpretation of each requires knowledge of their under, underlying assumptions, under, understanding of their operations and recognition of their limitations. So, once we know what is the assumptions which has been assumed for the approach, one approach is equivalent linear, another approach is nonlinear. So, before using those both the approaches we need to understand what are the assumptions for both the cases, uh, how they operate and how the results coming out of these uh, need to be interpreted. <clears throat> Neither of these approaches can be considered mathematically rigorous or precise, uh, though normally this nonlinear uh, uh, models are considered to be more rigorous compared to equivalent linear model. 
yet their accuracy is not inconsistent with the variability of soil conditions. So, accuracy will depend on the soil conditions, uncertainty in soil properties and whatever the scatter you have in the experimental data uh, through which you de determine the input parameters for particularly for the nonlinear model. So, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you.